Let me introduce very briefly my role in this is just as a moderator to tell you what we as the ECH Alliance are doing with Africa. As you know, we were originally the European Connected Health Alliance. We became the Global Alliance uh, in March 20, 2020, which coincided with, of course, COVID. And because of COVID, I've spent quite a few visits in the last two years to Africa, a, a continent I didn't really know and still don't know a lot about. But what I have found is that the perception of Africa in most of our minds is wrong. The perception in most people's minds comes from television or stories you read uh, on, on the, the internet. What I find there, and I do find, and you'll hear it this afternoon, is the incredible scale of Africa as a continent. I won't steal Phil's thunder, he's gonna to talk to us about that. But the enthusiasm to fulfill the needs of Africa and the growing population. So I see Africa as a land of opportunity, not for us, and I'll say this, uh, which will probably upset a few people somewhere, uh, I don't really care, uh, is we're not here to recolonize Africa. It's been colonized too much, and indeed it should never have been colonized. But as somebody said this morning in another session, he said, at the end of the World War II, a group of people sat down and made decisions about the rest of the world and including Africa. There were no Africans at the table. Africa is rising as they call it. Africa is a world power. If it were one country, uh, like the US would be, uh, it may be taking, the voice may be more strident and obvious, but look Phil will explain, and so will Declan, and, and indeed Alain, as the way Africa has reorganized itself. So watch out for Africa. See it as a great opportunity for two-way traffic and trade. Uh, and um, we in the Alliance are committed uh, to being involved in Africa from the last couple of years, and will continue to do so, uh, and will continue to support the initiatives in Africa. So with that, I'd like to not introduce all the panels, one at a time is quick, quicker. Uh, we'll start with uh, Phil. Now, he's given me a challenge, which is his name. Uh, and I'm, he's going to laugh when I try to pronounce his surname. Now, he's called Jean Philbert Nissingema. Is that close, Phil? That's close. I'm getting better every time. Um, Phil, as you'll see, is with the African CDC. And uh, we work very closely together on lots of initiatives. So I'd like him to begin by telling us his view of what's happening in Africa and how we, on a global basis, can participate in that. Then we'll move on from there to the WHO, represented here by Alain, who will talk about the in digital health initiatives in the WHO, which apply not only to Africa, but clearly to the world. And then we'll end up with talking to Declan, who works with the Alliance as a partner on the UN the WHO and the European Commission. So the idea is a dynamic session. We will try to find time for questions at the end. So Phil, do you want to start? Thank you, Brian. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, first of all, let me thank Brian and Tim ECH Alliance for this opportunity once again to, to be here and, and to talk about something that uh, we are both passionate about. And thanks for the recognition of Africa, and, and I think recognizing some of the painful history that we've gone through as we build a new relationship that is turned towards the future. Last week I was in British Columbia in a, in a, in a town called Victoria, and it was a, a university setting. Every faculty, every student, before saying anything, they would do some, something called land acknowledgement. They say we are here and we are fortunate to be standing on the land of the, of the First Nations of Canada um, and we are their guests. And I found as an African, the only African in that place, that um, that land acknowledgement is one way of righting the wrongs that were made, even if it's symbolic, but for me it was very, very uh, deep. It resonated with me so much. So what you just said here, on the podium, um, uh, Brian, I, I want to thank you for that. And I want to say that the Africa rising, 
there are several ways to look at it. First of all, uh, I hoped my slides will be here, but it's okay. Many people have a wrong image of the true size of Africa. There is no question about that. Uh, Africa geographically can contain the whole, of, the whole of United States, China, India, and Europe combined. Just, just take a minute to absorb that, and it's true. It's in terms of square kilometers or whatever, that's the true size of Africa. And Africa is also incredibly young. The average, uh, the, the median age in Africa is below 19. In some countries, the median, like Niger, the median age is 16. And when you look uh, 25 years from now, every, in, you know, one in every two babies being born will be born in Africa. So that says really a lot in terms of uh, the position that Africa holds in our global shared future. And I think it's high time to really strengthen this kind of, you know, win-win uh, uh, partnerships, uh, mutually respectful partnerships, uh, so that we can shape that future together, as opposed to what happened after the Second World War, even 50 years before the Second World War in Berlin, where a few guys uh, sat and decided what the global future would be, whether you want it or not. So. Uh, again, thank you for, for, for providing this uh, platform to discuss that. I think the third element I would like to, to talk about as far as the Africa rising um, narrative is concerned, Africa's economies are growing phenomenally. Six out of the ten fastest growing economies in the world are located in Africa. So just in case somebody hasn't really been at paying attention in terms of where to direct investments, where to initiate new partnerships, even if the starting point is really low. So it's not the market you go to make a quick kill. It's a market you go to to make a long-term investment because you know that it's a safe bet. That market is growing to grow and grow very fast in the foreseeable future. And I think the market will reward those who will have a long-term vision and commitment as opposed to those, and there are so many who come, make a quick uh, deal, extract some money or some metro, uh, natural resources, and just go back. So I want, I want to go there. I don't know whether you want me to dive into the digital health strategy that... Um, yeah. Okay. With your permission, um, I would say that digital health plays an important role in this whole Africa rising. Because if you think about it, we've committed as part of the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals to extend universal uh, health coverage to everyone by 2030. Today, more than 50% of uh, Africans live at more than five kilometers of any health center. And in many of those places, there is no electricity, uh, and other types of infrastructure are, are, are still lagging behind. The only type of infrastructure that reaches everywhere is mobile. So the opportunity we have today is how do we use the mobile technology to extend a healthcare access and good healthcare, not just bad, and then affordable healthcare to everyone on the continent. It's a multi-billion dollar opportunity for investors for innovators, for policymakers, uh, and, and, but it's also a great challenge that no one can solve on their own. So that's number one in terms of priority, connecting everyone. So this morning we were discussing about one of our flagship initiatives called Health Connect Africa to bring 100,000 health centers and 2 million community health workers on the internet platform. That's number one. Number two priority is the health workforce. Today, on average, there is one doctor for 20,000 people. I think here in Europe, it's about one for 250 US, you know, 400. But you understand, in some countries like Niger, we're discussing with our friend there, one doctor for, uh, for 20,000 
patients. So again, how do we use technology to create a multiplier effect on, on the few human resources we have while we train, and especially training for digital health skills and competencies so that the healthcare providers, those on the front lines, can use technology. Again, training them is, is a big uh, partnership opportunity that we look to, to collaborate with everyone here. Number three is health tech innovation. It's gonna be very difficult to just copy something that is working here in Spain or in you know, Estonia or wherever and then paste it in Africa. It's, 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 it has to be contextualized. We can copy the ideas, we can, we can borrow a bit of the technology, but I think homegrown innovation is what is going to work. Of course, there are global standards that we are committed to follow so that this data at some point I can get continuity of care. Uh, when I'm traveling, when I'm here, I should be able to carry my own data in my, on my handset. Um, but the rest of the programs, uh, the diseases, public health challenges that are going to be solved by local innovators in collaboration and partnership with global innovators. So that is a, is a, is a, is a third. Let me close on this one, which uh, Brian and I are really very passionate about, is bringing people together, recognizing that the, the, the ideas, the innovation, and the resources are distributed globally. So we've just launched the Africa Digital Health Networks as a, an umbrella for Africa communities of practice in digital health across to come together engage policymakers, engage innovators and investors, and be able to solve uh, for the challenges and um, realize the opportunities that are in front of us. Once again, thank you so much, and thanks for your attention. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> so good afternoon. There's nothing better than uh, being asked to speak during the postprandial slump. For those of you who don't know what that is, in clinical terms, it's when all the glucose has rushed from your brain to your belly. And with the lights in our eyes, we can stay wide awake, but hopefully you know, we keep you guys awake as well as we, we try to provoke some, some thoughts. Um, so fully agree, first of all, with, with everything that, that Brian and, and Phil have said. Um, Africa is a phenomenal opportunity, right? And for those of you who the, the, the graph that uh, Phil was referring to is absolutely worth Googling. If you haven't uh, looked it up, take a look at the, the, the image called the true size of Africa, because I think that that really drives home this point of the, the heterogeneity of the continent. And, you know, we, f we hear far too often this reference to Africa as some kind of monolithic entity, but there's, there's so much diversity in populations, in priorities, in, in governments, in, uh, in technology infrastructure that, that we have to acknowledge nuance as, as we work on, uh, on global health issues. And context is absolutely the, the central uh, driver of everything we do in, in public health. So, so just a, a quick nod to uh, those two important points. I think as we think about the opportunity on the, the African continent, there's some words that come to mind. You know, the, the word that's often used is uh, leapfrog, right? We've heard this when we referred to the, the meeting we're here, talking about mobile uh, telephony and, and mobile communications and mobile internet. Uh, I think the fact that we've leapfrogged over the, the uh, copper cable stage of evolution and gone straight to connectivity uh, through networks is, is, is more game-changing than, than you can realize. The, the life-saving potential of a phone call is, I think, vastly underestimated. We're so, we're so deeply in, involved in developing the next life-saving application or the, uh, the use of AI for, for pro complex problem solving. But I can tell you, I've been in, in, uh, in, on the front lines of public health now for, for almost 30 years, and there are so many instances, I can tell you, where a simple phone call was the difference between life and death for a pregnant mother in the hours after delivering a, a baby in a rural population. So, so, you know, when we talk about making infrastructure and, and uh, creating the conditions for healthier future generations, 
that's the first step is, is you know, strengthening uh, infrastructure. I think the other word that we often hear used is, is legacy. And in many Western countries, part of the, the problem, the challenge of introducing new technologies, and we saw this during the pandemic, the number of countries where exceptional legislation had to be introduced in order to take advantage of telemedicine was phenomenal, right? We actually had legislation across the globe that hindered the use of telemedicine as a solution. But when COVID came along, different regulatory agencies removed those restrictions, temporarily, mind you, so that we could do life-saving work when and where it was needed. And the, the uptake of telemedicine went up hundreds, if not thousands of percent, really opening Pandora's box to that experience of person-centered care. We talk about patients at the middle, we talk about person-centered care, but person-centered care means you as a patient get access to care when and where it's convenient to you in the middle of the night when your child has a has 103 Fahrenheit fever, you want to talk to a pediatrician, you pull up your device and you have access to a pediatrician. That's what person-centered care is. But yet we've seen so many um, legislative and regulatory hurdles that were put into place to really prevent the widespread use of, of these technologies. So in on the continent, I think we have to examine where there is the opportunity for uh, innovation that's not stifled by legacy and to see where we can really push the boundaries of what, what uh, is possible. And that brings me to the, the third point, and that is when we talk about digital health. For far too long, what we've been doing is taking analog systems and bringing them into a digital space. But if you think about the revolution that's reflected out there in halls one through seven, all of these exciting startups, the companies that have gone to scale, the various unicorns that are out there, they're about disrupting the way we do something, how we order food, how we transport people, how we ask for goods and services, leveraging the reality that these devices that are in every one of our pockets brings to the forefront. And so at WHO, when we talk about primary health care, we talk about immunization, the, the opportunity we have, and I'm going to use that word, Brian, because thank you for, for raising that, the opportunity we have across all of the different health domains that WHO leads on is to reimagine how do we do immunization if we're supposed to immunize every child in a population, maybe making up a list of children and then taking them off one by one allocating workers to different sectors is not the way to do things. There might be a, a new and innovative way that we can, we can leverage these technologies to ensure coverage. Maybe we put better emphasis on demand where clients can actually say, I want a refill on my family planning methods. Bring those to me now, right? Whether it's by a drone delivery or by a human health worker, these are paradigm shifts that we need to be thinking about. And Africa is absolutely the, the continent, I think, that will lead on this. When we think about where is drone delivery more advanced than anywhere else in the world, it's not in Estonia or Belgium or, or Canada, it's, it's happening in Rwanda. So I think these are the things that, that uh, are top of mind for, for WHO. I will just take a moment to, to say that connectivity in terms of human connectivity and the, the partnerships and collaborations that uh, Brian and, and his team are leading, but also uh, Phil is, is launching um, through the African Digital Health Network, that's what makes, makes global health successful. It's when people connect and start overcoming the, the imagined boundaries that keep us from doing things in the most innovative way possible, that's when you start unlocking uh, solutions. So I think you know, we've just launched at WHO a new global initiative for digital health that is a network of networks bridging the various networks that have emerged around the world, but with countries at the center. Because if there's one thing that will drive innovation in, in global health, it's when there is a clear set of guardrails that is established by the government in that particular context that, that defines the standards and the interoperability mechanisms 
that entrepreneurs will be leveraging in that, uh, in that particular geography, and then allowing for that entrepreneurial ecosystem to flourish. And that's what we're working with country after country to help build those foundational ecosystems, the, the building blocks, the, the digital public infrastructure, the legislation, the policy, the governance capacity that's needed for the entrepreneurial ecosystem to, uh, to flourish. So if you look at the four, four Y from four years from now, sort of horizon scanning, you know, it's our ambition that, that we'll see dramatic change uh, happen, but we know in realistic terms, legislation and policy takes a while. But I think committed people like those of you in the room today and here up on the dais can make impossible things happen. So uh, it's really exciting time to be in uh, global health. So just to follow up on that with Alain, the, I smiled when he talked about they had a change in many countries legislation to do when we introduced after in COVID, suddenly consultations, everybody wanted to talk to a doctor but didn't want to meet a doctor. Um, and one country, which is my country, which is Ireland, um, had legislation which said, the doctor only got paid, this is in the legislation, when he sees you. And then there's a whole discussion nationally about what does see someone mean? Does see someone mean, because it was written 75 years ago, that see someone is physically see them? And they had to change that, the words of that legislation to reflect the fact that we're all happy to have at least a virtual consultation as opposed to no consultation. So that's an example which I, I was involved in uh, when COVID was happening. And I thought, I suppose you can't blame people 75 years ago because they couldn't say see must mean in person. Um, the other thing I would say to answer on is we're very keen to support the WHO's movement and the, particularly the Digital Health Initiative and we through the Alliance will be informing all of you of what that initiative is and giving you ways to participate in it and to be part of it. This is not someone do this, this is someone that we have to do collectively otherwise it won't work. So you will see articles in our newsletters and on our uh, social media about these initiatives uh, so that you can do your bit because you can't always leave it to everyone else because it affects each of us. So at that, I'll move on to Declan who will introduce himself and he's gonna talk about things like money, but he may talk about money, but money makes the world go round. So over to you, Declan. Thank you, Brian. Great to be here. Uh, I, I suppose I'd, I'd like to start talking about uh, uh, radio astronomy. Um, as I've done a couple of times in, 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 over the course of the last two days. And you may not be aware that uh, uh, South Africa, in, in cooperation with a number of other African nations and uh, the Australian uh, partners, are, are building the world's uh, largest uh, radio telescope called the SKA. And when you Google that, uh, apparently there's a, there's a post-punk genre of music called SKA, which I'm completely unfamiliar with, but it's there, so you're going to get a lot of that. So go down beyond that and you come to SKA, Square Kilometre Array Telescope. And The Economist wrote an article, we presented the SKA, it was on the cover of Time magazine six years ago, and we presented it to, to, uh, in the White House to the uh, US President, and The Economist wrote an article about that, and it said that the SKA is, and I'm quoting, the world's largest science project. So when we're talking about all this innovation and data, just be aware that there is extraordinary innovation taking place today in Africa based on basic science. So when we look around the hall here and we, we, we listen to the enormous potential of digital health, it is going to stem from, I think, two considerations. One is data access and the other is the scientific innovations that are going to deliver these innovations that are going to help people and their health. So very, very important to, to understand that this is happening and this is happening today. So when we, so I want to use that to illustrate a, a very important theme, which I, I don't think is sufficiently spoken about, which is African leadership, not just in Africa, but African leadership globally. So again, enormous potential. And if you're wondering about the connection between radio astronomy, interfer interferometry, and geodesy, which are two of the sciences that are, uh, enable uh, uh, um, astronomy, Harvard University uses algorithms evolved on galaxy examination for brain scanning. 
and that's something that's all, all, already happening, just as an FYI. So my point in all of this is to really have a focus on African leadership on, on basic sciences, of course, as well as in the applied area. That's hugely, hugely important. And again, to repeat what I said, this has pointed to the enabling role of data. Brian mentioned um, decolonization. I think this is hugely important, and of course, it's a very, very common theme. But my take on that is, and again, you know, inclusion and equity, we're all committed to very, very, very important. And inclusion is about having, you know, wonderful people in rooms and meetings and bringing people together. I get all that. But I have a different take on inclusion, and I call it a data inclusion. The European Union is advancing, as we've, as we've heard, has advanced and not yet in, in, uh, applying, but will apply in 2026, the European Union AI Act, and the uh, US is, is doing uh, similar uh, moves on AI regulation, and both with uh, a broad ambition to, um, as, as it's presented, enable global standards, but in all of this, Africa has been excluded. So if we're talking about these innovations, we have to really put a spotlight on how are these regulations going to impact this future that we're speaking about today, and this needs to be understood. Now, sometimes I feel I'm a bit of a, a voice in the wilderness, because a lot of these issues, they're extremely complex, um, and as, as Alain said, you know, the time cycle in evolving regulations and policies is just far, far too long. That needs to be telescoped, but that's not going to happen today or tomorrow. But what is happening today or tomorrow, literally this year, is the application of the AI regulation in the United States. So really, we need to bring this to the fore, and I, I think I, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look at Phil here and really point to the need for African leadership. Uh, the US uses a phrase, you hear it very often, no taxation without representation. My take on that is no regulation without representation. And clearly, if the European Union and the US is advancing a global approach to the, the issue of AI regulation in that inimitable phrase which the European Union uses, which is called extraterritorial applicability, so it applies everywhere, no matter. And it's not just, it's not just AI, it's GDPR, it's medical devices, it's clinical trials, it's many other areas of regulation. And there's, there's literature on this, but my point on, on Brian uh, mentioning colonization, there's literature on this, and it, it, it's an example in the view of some of recolonization and data imperialism. And I think this is, this is emerging as a very, very serious issue and very serious topic. So I think we really need to be very cognizant of this, and I think it's, 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 it's really looking to the enabling the leadership role in Africa, not just on these technologies, but on the enabling environment in a global sense. So how do you do this? How do you do it in a very, very fragmented world? And I suppose, just to be underlined, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have the answers. I'm trying to pose some of the questions that are hugely important and don't have answers. But the, 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 the environment and the, 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 the context here can only be global. It can't be Irish, it can't be Bangladeshi, it can't be Rwandan, it's got to be global. And African leadership in that is hugely, hugely important. So I think the focus on Africa is a very, very important perspective in which we can look at our collective future. Brian. Thanks very much indeed, Declan. It's a classic Declan, which is why I want him here. We, don't, we tend not to do politically correct uh, panels. I don't, it's, they're not much fun. Um, but today is just about imparting some of our views about Africa. In a few minutes, I'm going to ask our team to look around, and because I can't see most of you, uh, to see if any of you want to ask questions. So do, if you, we may be able to fit a few questions in, I will in a moment. So there's a microphone required over here, if we can, some of our team are around. Um, while we're waiting for that, I just want to say this. Just before the session and listening to Irene, uh, we had a situation where um, we heard from Catalonia, this region we're in, from Jordi, who described the journey from paper to shared records, etc. a phenomenal journey, but one which was there was a vision, a strategy, and an implementation program led by Geordie and, and his team and the governments here, and indeed supported by the European Commission. That is an example of someone who's looked and thought in a different way to take Alan's point. Because that's happened, uh, I see places like Catalonia and perhaps Estonia and a few others as exemplars for Africa, not in a colonization way, but actually to impart that knowledge 
and apply what they can to certain parts of Africa. So there are huge, huge commercial opportunities as well in Africa. Uh, so bear that in mind. Have we got a microphone for just there? Just before you speak, can I just say anyone else want to ask a question so we can get a microphone? So there's another microphone here when this speaker finishes, just here. Please. Yes, uh, my name is Alexander Borbe. I just want to iterate what you guys are saying. And uh, a funny story, I was here in Barcelona 2008 and I was um, with Ericsson and they told a very funny story about Africa. They actually put one of these masks, the 2G masks up in Sudan in the desert and after a week it was overloaded. I mean, the electricity went. So the nomads who were traveling in the desert doing trade, they were texting so much that this, uh, their mass was overloaded. First time in their history. And that was 2008. So Africa, you skipped the landlines and it went just straight mobile. Thank you. The other question was from a lady here, I think. Apologies, it's quite difficult to see with the lights, so please introduce yourself and ask your question, please. Great, thank you, and uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for a great conversation. My name is Natalie Donbach, I'm a journalist with DevEx. Um, my question is for Phil. I know a colleague of mine spoke to you maybe a year ago, and back then I think it was 41 African countries that had digital health strategies, and I wanted to kind of ask for an update, you know, with the countries that you're working with, um, do you see some countries um, really making a dent in implementing those digital health strategies? Are some perhaps doing better than others and in which areas? Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. I think Alain may, may have the, the most updated. Uh, he, has, he has an entire division in, uh, based in Brazzaville <laughs> tracking those strategies and implementation. But I, I would say the number of countries having digital health strategies in place has increased. Uh, last time we counted, uh, March last year was uh, up to 47, which were almost, you know, more or less uh, active or uh, up to date, which had not expired. Uh, at some point, every country has had a digital health strategy, but some of them reached, you know, this strategy used to, uh, even still now, you know, 2025, 2020 something. So when we put our, in place our Africa CDC digital health strategy, we didn't give it a time frame because we are conscious that technology is moving so fast. And if we, we put a few investments and projects in the document, the document tend to start defining <coughs> what we are going to do and what we are going to not do. So we said, let's go by edition. So we, we did the first edition. Uh, I, I'm sure the second edition is on the way. It, it will be here before, uh, before end of this year. Just to capture uh, the new ideas, the new thinking, the new opportunities. When we launched, we had 10 projects in the document. Today we have 16 that are live. By the time we do the second edition, we could be having 20. So it's good to monitor the strategy, but the strategies, but I think there could be even different ways to scan and see what's really taking place. You know, the policies that are changing, uh, the, uh, the innovations that are coming that are nowhere in a, in a written document. So that's number one. Um, I think you pointed to a, an important issue. Having a strategy in place is one thing, but are they being implemented? I think that's where the, the biggest gap is, if you have to be completely honest. And it's not just in Africa. Everywhere, even in corporate environments, strategies tend to be one thing, because they have to be there. But life, life happens. And I would say, uh, in digital health, after COVID, um, all strategies, all of them became obsolete overnight. So right now, I think every country needs to review their strategy, try to align it to the context as much as possible, but be agile. Without agility, strategy is futile. Hello. Yeah, no, I'm itching, itching to get in on this one because uh, Phil and I have had many philosophical conversations about this. You're right, COVID threw the book out on, on the importance of, of strategies, because I think thinking has evolved quite a bit. Before the pandemic, where those of us who have been working in digital health would have to, to clamor for just a marginal bit of attention to, under, 
for folks to understand or listen to the word interoperability or listen to something about, about semantic and syntactic standards. Uh, now that conversation is integrated into how do we do health? So it's, it's not, it's, it's, yes, it's absolutely moving from strategies to blueprints, to action blueprints that are costed, but it's also about establishing institutions, right? The difference between digital experimentation and digital transformation is that someone is actually in charge of transformation. There is an institution, there is a governing body, there is a regulatory framework that gives capacity, authority, and mandate to a, an entity that is responsible to be the stewards or custodians of digital transformation. Very often it's cross-sectoral, so it's not just health, but it's making sure that as these solutions are being developed, they're being developed with person-centeredness in mind, with interoperability in mind, so that systems talk to each other, even if the politicians don't, that the systems do, and so I think we're seeing a sea change in the way we're talking, not about digital health, but as one recent World Bank report puts it, digital in health, right? So it's baked into the DNA of how we think about, administer, and deliver health programs. Thanks very much. I'm just gonna ask, um, and if I see another hand there, if someone can bring a microphone we'll be with, so we'll take your question in just a second. I'm going to ask Declan, our partner, to describe some of the things we've got lined up coming up this uh, September, I think it is. Um, we will be in New York for the Science Summit. And part of the reason we're doing that is to advance uh, a far more comprehensive understanding of the contribution of technologies, including the ones we're talking about today, in the attainment of the SDGs. I was having dinner with a number of um, African ambassadors in, in, in Brussels a couple of weeks ago, and they told me that they've stopped wearing their SDG lapel badge. And I, of course, said, why? Two reasons. They feel excluded as nations from the SDG process, and they are extremely upset with the slow progress. So looking at that again, another dimension of, 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 of inclusion is the leadership that is going to be very necessary from Africa in the definition of what comes next. And although the 2030 process, we've got a couple of years to go, the what comes next process will be launched effectively at the Summit of the Future, hosted by the United Nations in September of this year. We'll be there with Brian and other, other partners and, and, and uh, with JP. Again, just understanding or helping policy making at global level, understanding what is needed. We've heard the word fragmentation. It's everywhere. The UN is not, a, is not a legislature. It's not a regulator. But then who does regulation? Who does, re and, and again, these are some of, the, some of the questions that have to be asked. But I think in terms of enabling this, African leadership is vital, not just for Africa, but for the world. And I think this is a point that needs a, a much better, a stronger ventilation. And it can't be a situation where effectively a comparatively, relatively very few number of nations are not just regulating and, you know, as I've said, uh, 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 recolonizing, but that cannot be allowed to be happening in the wider policy context. So hoping we see you in New York in September. Thank you. So we're going to take the question and then we'll round up. Oh, yeah, hello. you are, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so hello, my name is uh, Miguel Luengo. I am the CEO of SpotLab. .de. It's an AI company that does uh, diagnostics for neglected tropical diseases and malaria, lymphatic filariasis, and others. So as an in vitro medical device, uh, I know that we can follow FDA standards C mark, but my question is like around what we can expect for regulation around AI for medical devices in Africa, whether it will be a fragmented space, will be a coordinated approach, or any other operation by which we we, you will follow blueprints from the EU or FDA. So what, what is the future and when do you think will happen? Okay, so I think the future is uh, one, uh, one regulatory framework for the whole continent. Right now, if you have to introduce a new drug or new medical device, you need to get licensed in every single uh, market in Africa. But um, uh, Africa just launched its own um, Africa Medical Agency, which is the regulatory body for medical, um, uh, medical products. Uh, there, there is still a debate on whether AMA would also regulate digital, 
<coughs> technologies like AI or whether there should be a separate body. Right now, every country is taking its own approach, but there are already conversations even in that area of AI regulation on how to harmonize and take a common position among the African countries, which would, should also be aligned to a global position because trying to regulate this continent by continent or country by country, it, that's not how digital or internet works. It's a global facility and um, I'd like to challenge back uh, Declan because the United Nations Secretary General has taken so many of the kind of these initiatives, you know, the global initiative on digital cooperation, on AI regulation, all those are there. So, and, and WHO from, from the um, health side also leads on a number of fronts to also harmonize uh, uh, the use of AI for health. So I think what we need is a strong global framework in which Africa would have had a say not just you know, invited as a, as, a, as a recipient or as a taker. Can I, can I just add to that really quickly? Because I think, <clears throat> so one of the, as of yesterday, the most popular website within the WHO pantheon of, of web pages is not about an emerging infectious disease or, or something. It's, it is the page that we just launched on regulatory considerations on AI for health. It's been, just in the last month been accessed 13,000 times. And so what, what we did was bring together regulatory agencies from across the globe, the, the best and brightest minds who've been th thinking about this, to put forward some of the, the core principles that are shared across our 194 member states, which includes all of the member states in, on the African continent as well. So, so I think we're looking at a future where there will be a lot of reciprocity, where regula regulations that are based on certain foundational principles that are shared will certainly serve as a starting point. So even if a country might want to have its own added uh, three or four additional layers to whatever framework is, is universally being accepted, that at least doesn't mean a company has to start from zero every time it enters into a new, into a new uh, geography. So, so I think you know, this idea right now we have countries across Africa, across South Asia, that have agreements, whether it's with the US FDA or with the, the European Union, to, to provide that reciprocity for regulatory areas where they don't currently have regulatory uh, leadership in place. And that's, these, are, these are bilateral agreements that are, that are in place in, in a number of, uh, of settings. But hopefully, as that regulatory capacity grows, we'll continue to see that the, the foundational principles that underlie a lot of these regulatory uh, frameworks will hopefully be transferable across borders. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we have 26 seconds left. So in addition, in a moment, I'll thank the panel. You can applaud them if you wish. Um, but what I want to say is this. We as the Alliance are determined to stay involved in Africa. We intend to continue to support all of these initiatives. It is not easy to make your way through this maze, but use us as the guide to that. So I'd like just to, if you would, please thank the panel for joining us today.